for him. I know. Not that great. But last week I thought my question was pretty good. They were awesome. No, I thought last all week your specifically. All the time are awesome. No, 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 that's not true. But don't overboard. <laughs> Were you, it was two weeks? Not two weeks? No, two. Two weeks ago. Huh? What happened then? You asked a question. No, no, no. It was, I think, last week pertaining to Adam and Eve and them. <clears throat> Yeah. I don't think I was here when that was. We came, we missed the first part, we came around. Yeah. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God's name. Um, Let's turn again to um, Saint John. No, sorry, Saint Matthew, chapter four. <coughs> we, um, we talked uh, last time about Saint John the Baptist in part four, and this is the tenth. <coughs> The tenth um, foreshadowing of baptism is to um, send the one who will prepare the place, the, prepare the way for Jesus Christ Himself is a, a baptizer. Um, he's also called the forerunner, and his birth was miraculous in the sense that you come out from a dead womb um, of, of Elizabeth to give birth to this great giant. Uh, prophet, and his job is to do two things: do everybody make everybody repent. And he he was prepared thirty years in the wilderness for this, and then he appeared. Um, speak for the truth that nobody um, he doesn't care for about any position, even his own life, and baptize Christ. So these are the three main roles of the forerunner and. It, it tells us, in fact, the message of Christ. So one, one will deliver the message of Christ in a very short period, the message of repentance, the message of saying the truth, and you don't care what will happen to you, and baptizing the Lord himself. And we, if we think about it, contemplate about it, this is, in fact, the same message as Christ. For Christ will not send the prophet that will be opposite to the message that is coming. The Christ is the fulfillment of the law. He did not come to abrogate the law, but to fulfill the law. So even the people who, whom he sends before him, they send the same message. And this is why he cried for Jerusalem that he tried, he tried to gather Jerusalem under him, and they did not want to. And he calls Jerusalem his own city. He calls them the one who kills the prophets, and that there is no prophet that dies outside of Jerusalem in the sense that the center of the law becomes now the persecutor of the prophets that Christ sent. And St. John the Baptist, it seems that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes did not listen to him. So it's not about Christ only, it's about any person who will rebuke them is an enemy. They feel he does not know anything. So sending St. John the Baptist, we should not only focus on him as a baptizer, but we should focus on him as carrying the same, like a rehearsal, a rehearsal for the coming of Christ. Here is, I send somebody very strict. <clears throat> he gives a very clear message. He tells the Pharisees in their face, brood of vipers. Because he wants to re people to repent, he will speak up the truth even if his life depends on it. So he, he goes to the king, King Herod, and tells him, it is not lawful for you to take your, um, your brother's wife as yours while he's still alive. When he dies, you can do this, but it's not lawful for you. So he's, he cries out, it's not lawful for you, it's not lawful for you. 
and he does the main the main message uh, which is revealing to us by his baptism to the Lord or witnessing witnessing the baptism of the Lord because the Lord is baptized by the Holy Spirit not John the Baptist bestows anything on Christ and he says this if we open together St. Matthew chapter um, 3 chapter 3 sorry which is where we ended last time but we have to build on it today by God's grace to um, So can read from verse 13. Maybe you can read for us. We covered this last time, but I think we need to uh, remember this giant um, prophet. When Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him, and John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said, and permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The statement of St. John, I need to be baptized by you, is the statement of all humanity to Christ. We're telling, all of us are telling Christ, thank you for you have baptized us. And we know now what we're baptized with. We're not baptized by just water, we're baptized by the Holy <clears throat> Spirit and fire. Which means that our old nature has died and our new nature is now living, the nature in Christ. So it tells us also by St. John the Baptist, how should people respond to Christ? So St. John the Baptist is coming to, to tell me what is the message of Christ? He's going to be calling for repentance. He, did, he will say, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. And I will not judge a person, but my words will. <clears throat> because of it's, it depends whether they heed it or not. Second, he will stand up for the truth and Christ will, will be standing for the truth in order for the twisting that happened to the law and the way it was applied uh, to stop. Because it, this basically this lack of care to the people and um, pressing one own agenda has to stop. The third one is, is that I'm going to give you a new life, and he, tell, and he gives us this by baptism. So all of us are baptized by the cross. All of us are baptized by the blood of Christ that uh, wipes our sins. And this, this was the message of um, <clears throat> the epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. That God came to forgive us our sins, and it's what an eye has not seen, what an ear has not heard, what has not come upon the heart of man, what God has prepared for those who love him. Um, what, what, is, what is that an eye has not seen, an ear has not heard, uh, what God has prepared is forgiveness of sins. The, the, the fact that you don't have to offer sacrifices, you don't have to do any of the rituals of the Old Testament, and your sins are forgiven, this is what an eye has not heard. What an, what an eye has not seen, what an, eye, what an ear has not heard, what has not come upon the heart of man, what God has prepared um, for everybody, for us. So, so St. Matthew chapter, um, chapter 3 is telling us, basically, this is very clearly. What else? Um, I want us to to go to St. Matthew chapter 11. Just type it here for the online. The Lord himself is testifying for St. John the Baptist in order not to forget who he is. So, um, 
<clears throat> we'll read from verse 1 to verse um, 19. But I want to read first till from 1 to 6. So, Bede, can you reach us? Matthew 1 to 6. Now, it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, and the lame walk, the, leper, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. What does this tell us? Why, why, why did Christ answer the disciples of St. John this answer? Any input? Instead of giving John the directions, Okay, very good. Is Saint John the Baptist stumbled, not sure who Christ is? Hmm? His disciples. Very good. So his disciples. Saint John is sending them to Christ in order that they hear it from Christ Himself, so that you don't have to even believe John. Go and look for yourself, basically. Go, go you be the judge. And that's why this passage ends with what? What is the verse that ends this passage? Blessed is he who does not take offense in me or does not stumble me, doubts me. So when any of us doubt Christ, Christ is tell us, have you read the Bible? Have, have, haven't you seen that I could open the eyes of the blind, that I could raise the dead, that I resurrected? And now the, the whole story is finished for us. The whole events are finished. This is just now a, a snapshot from what he told the disciples of St. John. But for us, we know the whole package. So, and also St. John in prison, he does not care to come out or not. <laughs> what he cares about he didn't even tell the disciples, go and ask him to pray for me to get out of here. He's so happy to testify for the truth and to be in prison. This is the attitude of, uh, of the people who really, really want to be with God, is to suffer for his sake. Um, so God will allow each one of us to, to have this opportunity. Sometimes we will jump on it and sometimes we may not jump on it. And it's a cross. So in it we have to be asking for him like these disciples. I know that you open the eyes of the blind, so open my eyes. I know that you open the ears of the deaf, so open my ears. I don't want to stumble in you. It's the devil that gives you these thoughts to stumble in you. So the sending of St. John the Baptist before Christ is really a rehearsal for us. Do we have the same attitude uh, as St. John the Baptist or do we have the attitude of the Pharisees. Um, he's telling us also that is greater than John here. When he tells us that St. John came, he's greatest among the born of women, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than St. John the Baptist. And he's referring to himself, obviously, because he's younger than him. And also to all of us, but we're going to read this when, I, when, I, um, when we get to this passage. So, Over and over, the new dimension we're adding for the presence of St. John the Baptist is not just a baptizer. He is the copy of Christ coming before Christ to prepare. Prepare the way, prepare the mind, basically. Repent. I will stand up for the truth no matter what will happen to me. And I will be baptized in the blood of Christ, which is um, buried and resurrected with him. So for us, this is our three our three missions as Christians, we're going to repent, we're going to stand up for what is truthful, not, not in, in legal term, but with myself. I'm going to tell myself, this is a sin. I'm not going to spoil myself. If I'm doing something wrong, once I stop from what is wrong, things will fall in place. 
but I can't be finger pointing. Honestly, I have to look within myself. And this is the repentance that St. John asked for, the people to really look within themselves. And the last one, which is my baptism. My baptism happens by my uh, repentance and confession because of course baptism is a sacrament that's done once. So let's follow up on what the Lord will say about all of the Christians that will truly follow him. So as we said here, we're not just talking about St. John the Baptist as a symbol for baptism or the baptizer, but we're, but we're reflecting on our condition compared to him my condition compared to St. John. Because guess what? We are all John the Baptist. We're all preparing the way for Christ before his second coming. So Christ sent one to prepare, and all of the prophets, not one, all of the prophets and the events and the cities and the history and the prophecies and the promises and the covenants, the beautiful Old Testament. It's not all. In the sense that in it is Christ to prepare for his coming. And he focused very, very much to show us the communion, which is what we covered before. Now we're focusing on the baptism, and the next series will be on the Holy Spirit. You'll be amazed how much of the Holy Spirit is hidden in the Old Testament. It's unbelievable. Uh, I hope that you'll even grow to love the Old Testament because of how Christ is hidden in, in it. Okay, so let's read from verse 7 to verse 14. Um, verse 15, and we'll, uh, we'll contemplate honor by God's, God's grace. <coughs> Andrew, if you can read for us, because you're closest to the money. Chapter 11. Chapter 11 from verse 7. <coughs> As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go, to see, go out to see? A man clothed in garments, in soft garments. Indeed, those who wear soft, soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face. Who will prepare your way before you? Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, and he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Okay. Where did we read that verse? I behold, I send my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. So remember where it this last time, where, which book it was in. It's a very famous verse. Hmm? Malachi the book of Malachi. So John is referred to as an angel. And let's explain a little bit of this, that um, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him, which means that the, the grace of the New Testament is greater than the old. The least in the kingdom of heaven means anyone in the New Testament, according to our birth, because we're born again from heaven by baptism. So our birth is greater than St. John the Baptist's birth and mission in the sense that we are born in the grace. And that's why Christ said this, that the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him according to the law, not according to the actions, because St. John the Baptist's actions, he said, there's no one born among women greater than him, greater than St. John. Is, is this clear? So the least means the New Testament makes any person born in the grace greater than what St. John the Baptist enjoyed. Because St. John the Baptist, when he died, he went to Hades. He did not go to paradise. Paradise is still closed. All of us, because we're born in the New Testament, God willing, if we adhere to what we have in baptism, we will not see Hades. We will go to paradise. So that's why Christ said that the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater. He could not say it any less than this because this is in fact is a, what he will do, the New Testament, and he will do it by his own blood. We read last time when we read um, Hebrews chapter 10, a way that he has prepared, he has sanctified for us um, by his body that is the veil. So 
he cannot he cannot say about his salvation it's comparable to saint john the baptist this is not ego this is really really to tell us that christians in the new testament are the best existence ever so he tells all of us any one of us look how graceful you are any one of us in terms of what we enjoy is bigger than what saint john the baptist enjoy enjoyed because he was still an old testament figure he died before paradise was opened but in terms of actions i couldn't find anyone better to send them even my disciples one will deliver me and one will deny me and the rest will run away <laughs> so this is this one man that puts to that dwarfs my disciples basically in how he stood up for the truth without being with him whereas my disciples they saw the miracles they did the miracles they cast out demons they healed the sick and where were where were they when i was crucified nowhere so god is asking all of us please for my second coming do like saint john the baptist don't i cannot say don't do like my disciples because after the after the pentecost now the disciples are really completely transformed so don't do like my disciples before before the the resurrection day and before the pentecost day let's continue so verse uh, verse 12 yeah is, we're going to give it some attention okay. and from the days of john the baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force okay the kingdom of heaven suffers violence I have a Persian friend that used to work with me and he used to tell me religion is the reason for all wars in the world. <laughs> it's hard to answer this statement. Yeah. But it's not because, because of the religion. It's because of the false religions that fought Christianity. Because the original Christianity did not have wars. Of course, when Christianity gained power, we started having wars. But in its essence, Christianity is always in a war done against it. And, and, and that war is, comes in different forms, which is in the book of Revelation, appears as the, as the white and the red and the black and the pale horse. The white is the apostolic age. Who of the apostles was not executed or tortured? The next one, the blood of the martyrs that christianity is just a target so it the christianity is always in a war but but the war is done against it but it never it never failed and then after the martyrdom ended immediately like 10 years later we come up with a heresy the heresy of arius that almost to eradicate it from the church took 100 years although it was answered early on but it took 100 years to overcome arianism and the false religions, of course, grab from Arians because Arianism puts Christ not as God. He's less than God. So all of the false religions, they have one thing in common. The one on the cross, no matter what you name him, he's not God. You can call him son of God. You can call him God in the Mormons, but in a different sense than, than the God that we call. Um, in, in, in anything else, so you can you can immediately see the difference what is the devil trying to do he's trying to remove the identity of the man on the cross calling him a man however holy but he's not god because the essence of christianity the devil has to destroy this mission he has to destroy the god died for us and this is where the ridicule happens from for the christians you follow the crucified I mean, and you call him god and you die for him yeah that's that sounds crazy but it's the truth. And that truth, if it were not truthful, Christianity would have ended very quickly because it's built on a lie. It's built on a fallacy. It's built on a message that's not true. Because the message itself is crazy. How would it last? So our strength is, is in that weakness, that our God was crucified. This is our strength. Therefore, it makes death, it makes death an enemy that is easily overcome because we're not afraid of it, supposedly. So, just remember this. So, 
So what is this violence? It's the violence done against the Christians. And another thing which is more important, the violence that you do against yourself, that you be violent with yourself. I have to pray. I have to fast. I have to stop a certain sin. I have to fight against myself, my tendencies. That's the only enemy is yourself. And God knows this, and that's why he allows us with repentance and confession that you can project yourself to another person, but carries the priesthood and carries the secrecy, and his salvation is tied to yours. He cannot lead you but to salvation. There's no option. And he loves that. That's the key. It's not a duty. It's a pleasure. So... The, the repentance and confession is I'm sitting with the Holy Spirit to help me to fight. The, the, one of the terms of the Holy Spirit is called the defender, the paraclete. Paracletus is, means defender, lawyer. What is he doing? He's defending me in front of the devil because the devil is, what is the name of the devil in the book of Revelation? The accuser. The accuser accusing us in front of God day and night. He doesn't stop this. So he comes to your mind and says, God is unfair. And then he goes to God and says, why do you pay attention to him? He's insulting you. <laughs> He's amazingly unputting a wedge. But of course, God doesn't listen to him. But unfortunately, we do. So we have to fight. That is exactly, exactly what this verse is. That the, the kingdom of heaven is taken by force. And who is with us in this fight? God is with us. So we might fall all the time. But if God is with us, who can be against us? It doesn't mean that he left us at all. He doesn't leave. Even if we fall and we leave him, when we come back, there's no conditions for coming back. The one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Okay. 13. 13 in the same chapter. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah. Who is to come? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's a choice. God is not going to compel us to believe in him. He doesn't come with a sword and say, if you don't believe me, I'll kill you. If you have ears to hear, listen. If you don't, it's up to you. But my words, my words are spirit and life. So it's good for you to hear it. And you can tell from my attitude, this is what God is saying. Look at the people I send. Do they prove that they want money or covetousness or position? Look, look at them. I'm sending people that have no interest in the world to begin with. The, the, leaving the world is, is, is a joy for them. So this is the extreme genuineness. When somebody has no self-interest in what he's preaching, and that is exactly what the disciples and what Christ and what St. John the Baptist, who of them was like telling, like store things before you leave this world. No, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave. This is the fact that no one will be able to go around. Naked I came into the world, and naked I will leave. Then he says that, that he's Elijah, because he has the same spirit of Elijah, not heeding a king, Ahab, and his wife Jezebel. And their, and their prophets. And we, we looked at this as a symbols of one of the symbols of, of baptism when we talked about the, the water that swallowed the whole sacrifice with the altar, um, the fire, sorry, that swallowed all the whole <coughs> sacrifice and the water around the altar. And to, to, to prove that, that God of Elijah is the true God and God of Baal, of the, of the prophets that Jezebel uh, brought into Israel are false gods. So God is going to look for us in these personalities. Repent, be hard with yourself. Stand up for the truth with yourself. Because this, this implies being merciful with others. I, I need to be forceful with myself and merciful with others. And enjoy your baptism, your identity. You're going to heaven. Depending on if you want it that badly. And God, of course, would want something that badly. He will give it to us because he wants it all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Let's go to verse 16 because I want to continue till verse 19 and we'll um, in chapter 13. All of this is under why God had to send somebody before him and his job was to baptize in order to give us this message and in order to give us this personality 
that we ought to have if we want to receive him. So, so the people who receive St. John the Baptist will be ready to receive Christ. If you receive St. John the Baptist and he's that harsh, look at the gentleness of Christ, which is now going to be in this passage. And that's why this passage is put behind the next one. We talked about force and taking it by force. Look how Christ preached his mission. It was not by force. Look at the comparison he will make between himself and St. John is that people are always complaining. They don't like anything. St. John comes this way, they don't like him. I come this way, they don't like me. So I don't know what to do with you, basically. Caroline, can you read for us from verse 16? But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man shall come, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is justified by her children. Yeah, so God is telling us, I don't, I'm not coming by force. I'm not going to force any. In fact, I'm going to come that you that you will feel I'm very approachable. Christ was extremely approachable. Let the children come to me. Um, and, and this is what made him win a lot of people. Maybe they left him at the time of the crucifixion, but definitely large amount, maybe 3,000 of them converted in one day of the Pentecost. So it's because of the personality of Christ, how approachable he was. So I sent you somebody for a short ter- ter- period to really tell you, repent. And of course, to fulfill that, he reveals the Holy Trinity to us. He's, what he's sent, being sent to do is, is for the Feast of the Epiphany. But I came, I'm going to stay longer with you. So I came going to parties, <laughs> by his own choice, of course, and different. And he would, in these parties, there is drinking. There is, um, of course, there's no sexual immorality. There is... Um, tax collectors, there are sinners, and he's sitting there. He's not sitting there asking, when is the next party? <laughs> <laughs> he's sitting there because he has a purpose. He has a purpose. The purpose is to invite all of these to the kingdom of heaven. And, and that is the really, when, when we have that purpose in, in our life, is that I, I will go whatever and wherever, of course, with limitation, in order to bring a sinner to the kingdom of heaven. And with all, with all awareness that I don't fall myself. So this is where wisdom, that he says that wisdom is justified by her people. So the problem is not in the wisdom. This is why this verse, the wisdom is, is good because when you see people having wisdom, <clears throat> you will see how it's beneficial. So that verse, which is sometimes difficult um, to say, it says wisdom in, in the NASB translation, it says yet wisdom, is vindicated by her deeds. Mm-hmm. So the, quali- the, 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 the virtue of wisdom, in order that it defends itself, and it tells us, please have me as a virtue, um, is defended by the, by the actions of those who do wisdom. You can tell that their actions are correctly. So this is vouchers for wisdom. That's why the Lord said, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds, or wisdom is vindicated by her children by her offspring, the offspring of wisdom. So to, to, to tell us God, because sending St. John the Baptist is not to be boastful about himself, but in fact to tell us all of my children, I want them to be like St. John the Baptist because St. John the Baptist and I are identical, just with different approaches. One is very short very stern because it's short and one will 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 take it step by step and do and do the miracles St. John the Baptist did, did not do miracles and that's why when he was asked go and ask the person about well, Christ is it you or we should wait for another and then he says the following that um, if hearing about um, go and tell John what you hear and see that the blind see the lame walk the lepers are uh, cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are risen, 
and those who are broken hearted are preached to, blessed is the one to, blessed is the one who does not stumble in me. And this is by God's grace should stick in our mind. Let's go to the end of chapter 13, because, uh, chapter um, 11, sorry. Where God is asking us to come to him. And you see, you see now, if you read the gospel, one chapter after another, as we're given a different depth than just reading chapter by chapter, is that in this chapter, God is telling us, come to me. Because the message of St. John the Baptist, he, he did his job. Now, now it's me. So let's read from verse uh, 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amazing. So, Christ is saying, come to me. And he's saying, come to me because of his identity, you know, because of his ego. Again, when, we in, when, when Christ even invites people to himself, he is not pride. He's not proud. It's not out of pride. Definitely, he's not jealous of St. John the Baptist. But he does it in order to tell us, I am the real one. And St. John the Baptist believed in this. And that's why St. John the Baptist, when his disciples asked, he did not give an answer. He said, you go and ask him. In order to hear and to see with their own eyes, St. John, of course, knows for sure. He saw the baptism. He saw the Holy Spirit. He knows that for this he came. He doesn't stumble in Christ. I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants or to babies. Hidden what things? In Christianity, there's nothing hidden. What is hidden or what is done invisibly is the sacrament. And we have to have an element of something that our eyes don't see. And unfortunately, there are people who might stumble in this, the work of the sacraments. The, and God is warning us from this verse. If you want to be intelligent, if you want to be wise, you have to know that I have, in order to leave myself for you, in order to baptize you, in order to give you the Holy Spirit, I left an invisible work by the Holy Spirit. On the spiritual level, is that Christ is the truth. He says who, who he is. And he's coming to reveal to us the Father. Yes, Father, for this way was well pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me. That the equality between the Son and the Father. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. That is the divinity of the Son. It takes the Father to know the Son. We usually think of the opposite. No one knows the Father but the Son. But we have to pay attention to this, that Christ is saying, no one knows the Son except the Father, which means the Son is God. If it takes the Father to know the Son, then the Son is not any less than the Father. So we have to remember this verse 27, one of the rare verses where the Lord is saying that he is not easy to know. His divinity is not easy to know. It takes the Father to know the Son because the Son is equal with the Father of one essence. And as we said, the Osea or the essence of God is that his Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the hypostasis of God or his roles are the hypostasis of the Father who is unbegotten, the hypostasis of the Son who is begotten of the Father and takes flesh and saves us, the hypostasis of the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father sent by the Son 
in order to do the work of the Son on earth and connect us to the Father. This is the hypostatic role of the Trinity because they have roles, but they are of one essence because our God is a triune God. That is basically the Trinity, the difference between the Osea, which is the essence and the hypostasis or the, the, the presence of each of the, of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit in different, in different capabilities and different roles. Okay, 28, the verse that of course we all love most, and we, God is asking us to go to him, go to the church, go to, if we need help to get to him. So Dan, if you can read this for us. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We may disagree with the <laughs> first 30. Because <laughs> I don't think anybody has an easy life. So is Christ uh, giving us a, a, a marketing plan here that didn't work? <laughs> <laughs> How is his yoke easy? I think we all agree that Christ doesn't lie, right? <laughs> he is the truth. So why is he saying his yoke is easy? Has anybody have troubles in his life and says, oh, it's easy. <laughs> I really enjoy it. <laughs> how? Exactly. That's exactly the essence of it. So the how. That's the what. He makes the hard things easier. He gives us peace through, through it. How does he give us this faith? Sure, these are all the Asians, the virtues, but what did he leave for us that makes us feel that his our burdens could be a glory, not a burden? Exactly, as Liana said, his way of death and his way of life. Uh, if Christ came rich and died normal and says, here is salvation and, overcame, and resurrected, okay, that salvation would be done this way. Because the whole essence is to overcome death. And he would be died and resurrected. On paper, we overcame death. But he chose this agonizing way of life. He can't even eat, no money. The people in charge of the money box, the treasurer basically is a thief delivered by one of the disciples, sleeps outside, confrontational with the Pharisees, nothing he, he does that's okay. So his life, and then you complement this with, um, with his death. The way he died is what made St. Paul say the following. So let's jump to 2 Corinthians. Um, Second Corinthians, I'll tell you which chapter. Hey, I'll tell you just a second. I have to find it because some things are marked, but I can't remember where they are, so I have to look. Let's go to chapter 4. It's Second Corinthians 4 is a complementary to Matthew 11. And we got to Matthew 11 because we were in Matthew 3 of the baptism and we focused on the of personality of St. John the Baptist, not as a personality but as a mission and what we're asked to do in order to replicate 
as St. John was the forerunner of Christ in the first coming, all of us, all of us are the forerunners of Christ before his second coming. Sorry, and chapter 11 of first or second? Corinthians? Second. Uh, did I say third? first? It's second. No, I'm sorry. My fault. Okay. So, Daniel, can you read for us? We're going to read from verse 1. And please, let's see now. One of the followers of the mission gets it very, very, it's very, it's very light to quote St. Paul as a follower of the mission. He's really the, the voice of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit. But, but, there are some key words here. I want you to open your eyes to it. Without this, we will not understand each one of us. What's our role in the New Testament? It appears in in Saint John and uh, Saint, Saint Paul in, in Second Corinthians chapter four. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. <clears throat> okay. We have this ministry. That's by the way, anything he says is applying to us. That's why he says we, not I. So this ministry is what that you are in this life existing to reflect that the resurrection is real. The resurrection is real is only reflected when we give the attitude of I don't want to I don't want to fight I don't want to claim my fair share I don't want to I want to change my mind to really focus on heaven. This is the this is our ministry. And it's done by the way of thinking, which is Romans 12, renew the image by the renewal of the mind. We will not lose hope. Why do we lose hope? Because people want fairness. We want everything to be fair and square. And then when it doesn't happen, we lose hope. So our ministry in the New Testament is to change this attitude. And it only comes when you look at St. John the Baptist, when you look at Christ, when you look at the disciples after they, they believed in the resurrection and they lived it. Now, now it's... As I said at the beginning, nothing can stand in front of them mm -hmm. because death is not only acceptable, this is a gain. That, that, is, that is a way of thinking that nobody can stand against and no, no em empire mm -hmm. can stand against because how are you going to threaten anybody if he thinks that killing him is a gift? <laughs> that's exactly what Christianity did. That's ex and that's true. This is not a, like a hallucination. This is real. because Why is it real? Because they saw Christ resurrected. If Christ were not resurrected, how are we going to get this attitude? So let's continue with St. Paul. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by, by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So the Bible will be ridiculed. It's veiled. But it's veiled by the people who are insisting not to see Christ and not to believe in him. And these could be Christians, by the way, because we could be just Christians, but I feel that the Bible doesn't work. That then, then, you will, then you will not benefit anything from the Bible because it's all your logic, it's all your mind. As Alice said, faith. The Bible is revealed by our actions reflecting this. So please, always when you read the Bible, just tell God, I, I want to do this. Give me strength to do this. Whatever you're reading, then it's not veiled. It's very, it's very vivid inside of us. Okay. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should should shine on them. Okay. So we sometimes we choose the. This is what Christ said. People love the darkness. And they did not come to the light, and he is the light, because if they come to the light, their, their actions will be revealed. So they prefer the darkness more. It's exactly what St. Paul is saying here. Five. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light, of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay, so the glory of God is a knowledge that came only not from, it didn't come from a book, it came from a person. So it's not something we read, it's something we grow up with. What do we grow up with? That's why in the church we baptize children, we give children communion, because so to grow up with it, it's not here, here 
read this book and you will understand God. No, it's not, it's not the intention. It's the intention of the practice and the life of me as from the day I'm born. My mother, the church, takes me in and says, we have to go through this in order that you are brought up in Christ. And that is um, the, the, the beauty of Christianity, as it says, one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. What is another name for the sacrament of baptism? It's a sacrament of what? It has, it has another name in the church. If the, if the Eucharist is the sacrament of unity with God, what is the sacrament of baptism? Sacrament of enlightenment. Exact term for the sacrament of enlightenment, which is no darkness. To my um, pleasant uh, su su surprise is that I was um, reading the text of the, which we'll get in, by the way, of the text of the prayer of baptism uh, from the Greek church and how identical it is to ours, which shows that, that, that this, these rites are extremely old, that it's almost the same words are used in, in, in the churches, um, even if we use different liturgy, but the liturgy of baptism is almost identical. By reading for uh, Greek fathers and reading the text of the baptism prayer, and it's, it's exactly what we pray in the Coptic Church. So it has the same, the same direction, which is this person needs to be enlightened. And why do we ask, have you believed? Yes, have you believed? Yes, and why three times? And there's a reason for this, for the thrice um, questioning for the person if he believed um, before he gets baptized. Let's continue with what happens to an apostle of Christ. Okay, seven. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Okay. What is the treasure? The treasure that you are a Christian. In earthen vessels that you are. We're all earthen. We're all very weak. We're breakable, but not breakable that without fixing. We have a treasure, but the treasure is in a very weak vessel. I'm a very weak person, but I have a treasure. And the more I know that I'm weak, the more I'm strong. Because the more I, feel, I think I'm strong and I start facing people, facing the devil, facing sins on my own capacity, I will fall. I will be cut to pieces. But when I, when I avoid sin because I'm weak, I can't go to this area. I'm going to fall. I can't talk to this person. He affects me negatively. This is the success. This is the success. To feel strong, to stay in, in something that weakens me spiritually, because you say, I can handle it, this is the fall. Before falling, there is haughtiness. And before breakingness, there is the uplifting of the heart. Which means this leads to this consistently. So always say, I am weak. I am weak. I'm strong in Christ. That's to face sins and to tell Satan, may the Lord rebuke you. But don't, don't stay in situations of weakening your faith or your resistance to sin and say, I can handle it. That is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. That's exactly somebody outside of the Ark of Noah and says, I can swim well. I'm going to handle it. No matter, no matter how good of a swimmer, it, you will not be able to overcome. And the flood is actually the same term that St. Peter, because in First, in first Peter chapter 4, it says the flood of dissipation. It's a flood. What we're living in the world is not, is not just a drizzle. That it's a flood of temptation. And the more technology is amenable to all of us, that flood increases. And we're not, we can't get away from it because we can't live away from technology. But unfortunately, the devil puts upon him the power of using this tool in order to make the, 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 the temptation not only unavoidable, but it's pressuring on the person. Okay. Let's continue because it will get even nicer. We are hard, hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may 
be manifested in our body. This is it. What Liana men mentioned, the relationship to the cross, always carrying about in the body, the dying of Jesus. Saint Paul will not be able to tolerate the persecutions that are happening to him if God was not dead by crucifixion, the most cruel way to kill a person. After scourging, after the crown of thorns, after carrying the cross, after spitting in the face, after the punching, after actually holding a reed and press, pressing that, that thorns in his, in his head, plunging in his head. So after the abandonment of the disciples, after of the true trials, one at night in front of his own people, that should know the law very well. Like imagine Christ standing, standing, and the, the ones judging him are doctors of the law, and the law talks about him, and they are putting him to death. Like, like how much, the, how much, how heavy it is on him. Like in front of Pilate, he doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's just a, I, Pilate is clueless. But you, the high priest and the Sanhedrin, putting me to death. Very tough, very tough. So psychological pressure, mental pressure, physical. It is said that the contusions that the scourging did for Christ, the opening of the wounds and reaching even the muscles and front to back everywhere. It makes even breathing tough. And then you put the robe on him and then you take off the robe, you open the wounds. And then the, the, the this, this the, what you call it, furrowing, furrowing in Hawaii. F U double R O W is, is to, to open like tilling the ground. This was what, what the cross did to his back. It was these wounds to open it more and he's carrying it. And every time falls, it pushes and plunges. This is God. This is God. So St. Paul is able to take this as glory because God was crucified, not because God died only, because the way he died makes it relatable to anybody who goes to cross and says, it's a glory that it happens, it happens to me, something that happened to Christ. That is glory. Pain and tribulations for the Christians not only leads to glory, it's a moment of glory. You are glorified when you are in a moment of tribulation. And that's why always carrying, not when I'm in difficulty, always carrying about in the body, in my body, the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. So this is condition. If you want to be resurrected, you have to enjoy the glory of the, enjoy, enjoy not be tribulations and enjoying it, but of course it's painful. Christ was screaming from the pain, but it's for us. Yeah, the mindset of us as Christians going through the tribulations is because we're sharing with Christ. Now, how humble Christ is, is to suffer all of this, and he didn't do anything. He just created us. We brought this upon himself. So there is no love. There is no love greater than this. That's why people leave the world and go to monasticism. That's why they just um, cling to him, because um, his personality is unbelievable. In, in terms of love that he has. Okay, I want to, uh, um, let's continue because it's all about this concept, um, which is um, how to, how Christ's crucifixion affects us psychologically to, to feel that pain is, is glory, not just tribulation. 11, for we. Okay, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also manif may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. So the apostles will die so that Christianity would grow. This works in us so that you can live. So this is what a Christian, an apostle is doing. So this is the attitude that tells us that these people did not start a religion in order to get benefit out of it or power or people following them. It says, we're going to die so that you can, you, can, you can live, not we're going to rule over you. Okay. Um, let's go to verse 17, just to, for the sake of time, and see the punchline in this um, 17 and 18. This is the verse I would like you and myself to remember always. Mm -hmm. 
for our, for our light of affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and internal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. A choice. Do you want to cling to the temporary, which, or do you want to choose the eternal that nobody can take away from you? Mary has chosen the right portion. Martha, you are busy with so many things, but Mary has chosen the right portion that will not be taken away from you. You're entangled, entangled in many things, but Mary has chosen the portion that will not be taken away from her. And that portion entails, of course, that you have chosen life, you have chosen eternity. And our, and he's telling us so that we can, when, when you are in a difficult situation, this is how eternity is made, because without it, you, your account in heaven is empty. For momentary, if I read it in different, different in SP, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. So why God, my life has difficulty? Because this difficulty is not, not only not unnoticed, but it's without it, nothing is producing an account is producing for us an eternal weight and you compare here lightness versus weight because god doesn't write does god doesn't give the the spirit with the measure that doesn't give the reward with the measure you do something light and he multiplies it by a million and says here is it's 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 for you is very 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 unfair to himself god he tries to find anything good we do, multiplies it by 10 and stores it for us. And as we said before, your sins do not wipe your good actions. So God is even, you do something good, it stays. You do something bad and you repent, it gets removed. So he's always finding a way that the track record that he will show to the whole world of how you did the account um, will be displayed publicly. That's in First Peter Chapter one, that's uh, praise, glory, and 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 um, dignity at the revelation of Christ. So, what is the essence of this? Enjoy, we can live happily, but but in tribulations, which is heavy, and especially the things that occupy our mind. I know each one of us, each one of us has things that we think about, makes us toss and turn on bed. Um, first of all, first of all, know that every difficulty, God is is. He hears your breath, he counts it, he writes it, he takes care of it. If you have tears with it, he will wipe them away. Um, so when the tribulation stops, the, the writing of an account in heaven stops, just to let you know. So because good actions is a sacrifice, difficulty in, in, in yours is a, is a sacrifice. So because God is fair and you sacrificed, he rewards. He's, very, he's not just fair, he's extremely fair. So if you want the, the, the pen not stop writing, just tell God, let me look at the cross deeper. Let me find joy in my life. Let me thank you for everything I have. Let the difficulty that people do, here is the, the tough part. Should I stand up for them? Should I let it go? What do I answer? What do I do? Where is my salvation? When do I speak? What do I say when I speak? When do I keep silent? What, should I keep silent about this? Should I speak about this? Wisdom. Wisdom will not come without a relationship with Christ. Wisdom of this world will destroy you. Just flat out. You have not seen people dealing with one another in the wisdom of this world, and it, and it doesn't end in a fight. That is, it always ends in a fight because the devil is in it. Is the prince of this world. So when he's giving somebody thoughts that are not supported by the Bible, uh, he will he will make the person. Unfortunately, his mind will completely change. So let's go back to the to becoming like Saint John the Baptist. Like and always, by the way, his intercession. Uh, you have to ask for his intercession in the prayer because um, Saint John the Baptist is um, extremely extremely praised by God from from the own mouth of Christ. There's no one like St. John the Baptist. So he's in the face of God. Whatever you ask him, he's, uh, he, he portrays it to him. 
Um, we have, oh, we don't have any time left, but let's, um, because I wanted to link it today. We're gonna do this last thing. We're gonna open Acts 19. Acts 19. Five eighty seven. Okay, um, this is more of assuring us that the the baptism of Saint John the Baptist <clears throat> um, is nothing compared to the baptism in the name of Christ. So those who were baptized by Saint John had to be rebaptized in the name of Christ. So let's read this in um, what happens with St. Paul in Ephesus. Andrew, it happened. Chapter 19? Yeah, we'll read part of it. <clears throat> okay. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism with a baptism of repentance, saying to the saying to the people that they should believe in him who would come after him that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, had laid hands on them. His hands or hands? No, it just says, had laid hands. Okay. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were all, now the men were about 12 in all. Okay, thank you. So, what do we learn from this is that the people who were baptized in the baptism of St. John had to be what? How was the subject How was the subject opened? How did St. Paul know they were baptized in St. John's baptism? What was the question? The Holy Spirit. Into what then were you baptized? So what is the goal of the baptism? Is to be receiving the Holy Spirit. Because... Amazingly profound. Because Adam and Eve had the Holy Spirit and he left them when they fell. Mm -hmm. So in order to go back to be one with God and always guided by God, we have to have the Holy Spirit. So did you receive the Holy Spirit? This is the goal. <laughs> Are you a temple of God or not? First Corinthians 6. We didn't even hear, hear that there is a Holy Spirit. What, what is that? <laughs> so, so, so you didn't hear of this? You didn't hear of him? So how were you baptized? Or baptized in the baptism of John? Ah, oh, okay. We got it now. He baptized him and he did what? Ladies and so it's separate sacraments. He baptized him in the name of Christ. He told him, yes, you're right. This is very, very good. In fact, that St. John did all of this to prepare for Jesus. So this means that they were Jews. As an example, God, God did not leave them alone. They are Jews who are now in Ephesus. They are in the... Diaspora, because definitely they are not Gentiles. They would not have had anything to do with John the Baptist. So they were hearing the preaching of St. John the Baptist. They got baptized by him, and they went back to their city, which is Ephesus, because the Jews were dispersed in the whole world because of the captivity in the different empires. And nobody reached them. But the Holy Spirit is guiding St. Paul to reach these people who are ready for Christ because they repented. You see now why he sent one before him? Because they have the mindset. It didn't take any convincing. They had the mindset that repentance. And St. Paul told them, this is perfectly fine. But I just want to let you know that St. John the Baptist was pointing to someone after him. You haven't seen that someone. I saw him. I know him. So I have to rebaptize you in the name, the real baptism now, in the name of Christ. Why? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Then he laid his hand on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So 
from then on, when this started to spread, obviously, we started having the, the, the Mayroon being developed. I would, um, in order to cover all of these churches, because we cannot send these disciples everywhere to lay the hands. It, it's impossible, especially after the martyrdom um, and the growth of the Christianity. So may God give us that we, um, we listen to the Holy Spirit in all of our decisions to Christ as the glory of his good Father and Holy Spirit on that time.